Got a call this week from a good friend. Um, his wife had called him earlier in the day and asked him to pick up their son after basketball practice, practice in t at four o'clock. So my friend says, okay, I'll leave work a bit early, pick up my son at four o'clock. At 3.18, my friend receives a call from his son, seventh grader. Dad, practice ended early. Can you come get me right now? My friend said, all right, um, I gotta wrap up a meeting, tie up some loose ends, and I'll be right over. Head your way. Now my friend is wrapping up a meeting, tying up some loose ends, and the distance between seventh grade son and office about 15 minutes. Seven minutes later, at 325, my friend receives another call from his son. Dad, where are you? <laughs> my friend said to me, you know, I think maybe I need to help my son reset his expectations. And I was like, that's a great way to look at Advent. It's a season of expectancy, but also one where we are invited in to examine and even reset our expectations. Our lessons this morning, I think, reinforce this. First, we hear about the relationship between the people of Israel and John the Baptist. Israel expected the prophet of the Messiah to come in and prepare the, prepare the way in a sense of uh, confirming them, confirming them in their righteousness, to comfort them because of their heritage and rich traditions. But instead, they are summoned to the wild and confronted and challenged and called to repentance. Jesus asks, when you went out into the wild to see John, what did you expect? An easily swayed, soft robe wearing panderer or a prophet? John the Baptist had to help the people of Israel reset their expectations. And in the same way, the scriptures do that for us. Not every Sunday is Confirmation Sunday. Some Sundays are Challenge Sundays. Some Sundays are calling to repent. The scriptures keep working on us. I'm, I'm surprised sometimes by the expectations of folks who say to me, I'm frustrated that I have to come to church and hear about politics or money or war or justice. And I'm like, I didn't write the Bible. <laughs> it's not my fault. The Holy Scriptures challenge and confront us, our pride and our prejudices. We're offered a choice. Become renewed by the grace and mercy of God through repentance and recommitment. Or harden our hearts and then endure the just disciplines of God. Jesus had to help John the Baptist reset his expectations. John is in jail and he sends a messenger and he's like, Jesus, I really need to know, are you the one or aren't you? Just imagine this is like such a, 
a really severe existential moment for John the Baptist. His life's work. And he's not sure because he's, he's hearing things. The things that he's hearing run slightly contrary to his expectations for who the Messiah would be and what the Messiah would do. It's very common and, and, and understandable that John was like, well, now I know good things are going to happen, but they happen after the reestablishment of the monarchy, the line of David in fullness, after the liberation of the temple and the restoration of Israel's glory. And yet what he hears about Jesus' ministry out in the countryside doesn't align with his expectations. So lovingly, Jesus says, tell him this, because John knows Isaiah. The blind see, the deaf hear, Lepers are healed, the dead are raised. It's already happening. Jesus helps John to see and to hear that the kingdom of God is always nearer than we expect. It's more likely nearer to the street corner where the needy gather than it is to the great halls of power. And then Jesus says, let no one take offense at me. In our epistle lesson, James is helping the church itself to reset its expectations. This entire letter is written to a church in conflict. But it's a conflict that James sees as a positive. It's an iron, sharpening iron kind of conflict. It's what happens when the church decides we really want to be serious about being light in darkness, agents of peace, ambassadors of reconciliation, that we really want to be the sacramental presence of Jesus Christ in the world, which is complicated. And so there are going to be disagreements. There are going to be differences of opinion. But the question for James as he's writing to the church is, are you going to grumble against each other just because you're going through the stress of this conflict and you've got some bad actors who are misbehaving? Are you going to grumble against one another? That literally means are you going to turn on one another? Or are you going to work through it together, remembering you share the same mission, the same aim? We ought to expect failure and conflict and disagreements within the church. It's, the, it's what it means to be a church between the two reigns. James is observing the farmer in Palestine. He's like, he waits between the rains, the early rain and then the late rain. The farmer is situated in between, that season that requires a lot of work and a lot of faith and a lot of patience. It's a dry time. But the rains will come. This morning, the third Sunday of Advent, we're lighting the candle of joy. The candle of joy that we light represents a joy that is not easy. It's not so much a joy that we have as the joy we hope for. It's not so much the joy we possess as the joy we are promised. This is not the joy that you can click and order and two days later, free shipping, it shows up on your front porch. Although that's fine. This is not that kind of joy. 
What we're reminded of through these lessons is that the joy of Christ comes to us in forms of repentance and recommitment and renewal in allowing the Spirit of God to continue to reset our expectations and to have faith and to help one another have faith between the two reigns. It is James, after all, who sets the entire theme of his letter this way. Consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you endure the testing of your faith. For the testing of your faith produces endurance, and endurance will have its perfect end, perfect end our maturity, and our completeness in Christ. That's a sweet promise. Amen.